Salam alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak to all. Thank you so much for joining us here at the virtual Abbasi program in Islamic studies at Stanford. Thanks also to the Merkez Resource Center at Stanford for co-sponsoring this event. And we are so grateful to this fantastic panel of experts for joining us to discuss the various ways in which COVID-19 is affecting Muslim communities, Islamic institutions, and of course, individual Muslims. Since the outset of the pandemic, we have seen ways in which the changing guidelines, shifting and often inaccurate information, and institutionalized inequalities have had particular effects on Muslim communities in the US and around the world. We have also seen a range of responses from Muslim groups with varying advice on matters such as collective prayer, funeral observations, pilgrimage, charitable giving, and other pious practices. No community, of course, is unscathed by the pandemic, but many have particular concerns, needs, and realities that alter the ways in which the crisis has unfolded, differentially affecting certain populations, especially those already more vulnerable and structurally isolated. For the self-styled mega mosque here in the Bay Area, a concern is the huge reductions in their fundraising during Ramadan, a time when many Muslims give their annual zakat. But for smaller mosques with less wealthy and more marginalized congregations, the effects of sheltering in place are both more profound and less well known. Our speakers have experience in working all over the US and beyond as scholars, activists, and community leaders, and will share their observations and insights with us today. We also thank you for joining us in this less than ideal format and appreciate your patience. Please type your questions into the chat box directed to me, Anna Bigelow, the co-host. Please keep your contributions short and to the point so we can have adequate time for discussion. We will try to call on you if you'd like to ask, ask your question yourself, um, but we can also ask on your behalf if you will put the question uh, clearly into the chat box. So we'll begin with each speaker uh, talking for about 10 minutes and then open up the conversation uh, more widely among the speakers and with um, you, our uh, assembled audience. And we, again, appreciate your time and theirs um, today. So our first speaker is our own Abia Ahmed here at the uh, Stanford Merkez Resource Center. She is Associate Dean and Director of the Merkez and she has written and researched about religious pluralism and politics on campus, racial and religious minorities in higher education, American Islam and Muslims, and Islamophobia in higher education. And we are delighted to have somebody who is both trained and now is a major member of our community um, to uh, start us off. So if we can turn the spotlight over to Abia. And welcome, Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Salam alaikum, everybody. Um, and a very, very, very belated Ramadan Mubarak <laughs> to those observing. Um, uh, I understand we have some international visitors as well, so good evening uh, to those of you joining us from abroad um, and good afternoon to everyone else. Um, thank you, Anna, for that introduction. Um, I'm really, really honored to be part of this panel. Um, uh, I'm actually looking forward to learning from the rest of our esteemed panelists, so um, I'll keep uh, my presentation hopefully within 10 minutes. Um, I'm going to be talking about the effect of COVID-19 on Muslim students, um, and um, I'm going to try to share my screen so that uh, we can all see the PowerPoint. Here we go. There we go. Um, and um, I'm going to preface the, the actual presentation with the caveat that we have actually very limited data right now on, on how the pandemic has affected Muslim students. We have um, a survey that was done by the Center for Islam in the Contemporary World, world at uh, Shenandoah University and Muslim Life at Syracuse University. And that survey uh, uh, was done completed by almost 400 Muslim students across 32 states. So we have some quantitative data. And so I'm going to be using um, the preliminary report that they issued. They're still working on the final report. And you can look at that online um, if you're interested. And then I'm going to present, I'm going to sort of complement some of that with um, anecdotal and professional experience that I've had with students. So 
So that's basically what my presentation is based on. Um, since I'm also now in the in the midst of like writing my own dissertation, and um, you know, we were talking earlier about how you know academics sort of have to bring in theoretical framing every now and then. So uh, I'm going to just explain a little bit briefly about how I've been thinking about this. And um, uh, uh, Sharon Parts, who uh, wrote a number of books on young adults and their meaning making process, has basically come up with the metaphor of ship which is sort of like a crisis that young adults go through in college. Um, it could be a, any kind of crisis. Um, and so I'm sort of construing the pandemic as a shipwreck moment for these young adults, uh, in which that it has triggered this sort of meaning making process. And we'll see elements of that uh, in some of the challenges and the opportunities uh, for growth that are, that are being presented. Um, and this process basically it gets the students to um, go through these challenges, but they also, it also like, it's the idea is for them to reach new shores. And so they go through this process, they, they experience these challenges, and then they they meet the moment with opportunities and creativity. And that's basically how I've also structured my own presentation and that um, I'll address some of the challenges that, uh, that the survey and my data shows, and then I'll talk about the opportunities and the innovations that the students are going through. So um, let's start with the challenges. The first challenge is, is this is, of course, not specific just to Muslim students. This is across the board. There's, there are increased levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, according to the survey, 60% of the students um, indicated an upsurge in levels of anxiety and stress, and 30% increased uh, reported increased depression. Um, in my experience um, uh, with Muslim students uh, at Stanford, but also I would imagine this is true for any students who are left on campus at any residential institutions and who haven't been able to travel back home, this is definitely aggravated for these students living on campus. One, because they're not able to see their friends, there's strict social distancing guidelines, and two, it's now Ramadan, and it's a time when they look forward to celebrating with their friends and families, um, uh, whether it's on campus or off campus, but these students are sort of stuck on campus celebrating this month by themselves. So there's the, so that's one of the major challenges that we've seen happen for Muslim students. Um, another one is uh, that seniors who are graduating are dealing with disappointment. Um, obviously, this is not the culmination they would have expected for their four plus years uh, of, of, of hard work. Um, and so um, we've tried to sort of, even though the institutions are promising in-person graduations at a time that, that is suitable, um, they're not really um, that keen on having a virtual celebration. We've tried to offer them alternatives, but you know, they're still dealing with this, um, uh, this aspect. And the fact that having now been gradu graduating, they're, they're, they're worried about their job prospects. So there's this, this is shown, shown up in the survey as well. Uh, we've also heard about converts who are experiencing challenges on two levels. Um, one is, uh, you know, the fact that either they, they, their families know that they have converted, but they were thinking that they would never have to actually go back home, but now they have to go back home, and so they're home and they're experiencing this hostility, or there's converts who haven't yet told their families that they have converted, and they are um, uh, hiding their Ramadan observances, so it's really challenging for them to be practicing um, at this at this point in time, and so that's a, that's a kind of a niche and a particular challenge for for converts. Um, and then, of course, there's racial factors that are sort of are true across the board, um, whether or not it's students. But um, I, I'm going to let you know our esteemed speaker Marguerite address some of that as well. But uh, we know that Asian Asians and um, uh, Asians are experiencing hate hate crimes and uh, Black and Latinx Muslim, Muslim communities and families are particularly experiencing a disproportionate impact of COVID. And of course, this does not, ex is not uh, preclude Muslim students and their families from this uh, impact as well. And so these are some of the, the basically the main challenges um, that students are experiencing. Um, moving on to opportunities and innovation and growth, um, just to give you a little bit about my own positionality, 
um, you know, I started this particular role right before uh, or right as the lockdown was enforced uh, in, in the Bay Area. And even before I had started, the student staff that we employ at the Marcas had actually um, sort of um, already uh, sort of from the get go met the moment with creativity and I'll address some of that uh, as, as we go along. One thing that the survey noted was there is uh, increased religious observance. And this is consistent with the, the faith development or the meaning making process that Parks talks about. And so um, the survey showed that the stu students reported like about 40% indicating an increase in prayers, 28% uh, raising their voluntary fasts levels, and over 60% of students reporting an increase in their dhikr or remembrance of God. Um, in addition to that, 33% reported an increased interest in reading Islamic literature. So, of course, given that they are in this kind of difficult moment, they are looking to make sense of it, to make meaning out of it, and some of them are turning to religion or faith for that. Um, what we've seen, and this is what I was talking about earlier, is that students have also been extremely, extremely innovative in how uh, they have met this particular challenging moment. Um, Here's uh, the website that um, that the students created and launched. And so this is basically a digital version of the, the, the background. You see there's actually the physical center of the markers. And then what they did was they sort of created a digital version of that. And we still have all of our, um, our programming going on, except now that it's virtual. Um, you know, another, another thing that, that students have done is basically uh, created this project called the Community Creative Archive. And what they're doing through this is they're documenting experiences of quarantine um, through art, uh, poetry, through music. And I'll show you some of that uh, over here so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, the basically asking students to submit um, what, whatever, however they're experiencing quarantine, right? And so um, here's some of the art that has been submitted. We're right now in week seven, so you know the rest of it is sort of uh, upcoming. But just to give you an example of how students are trying to make sense of these things. Um, our political, religious, spiritual programming is still going. One opportunity is that remote speakers are now accessible digitally. So whereas it would have been difficult to bring some of the speakers to campus, students are now able to get them to uh, come on for Zoom webinars or panels. And we actually have an event tomorrow on, uh, on uh, Palestine and Kashmir uh, called Occupation. Um, and so, um, so, that's, uh, so, so that all of that is still going on. And then in addition to the digital programming, um, we've been working with the Muslim Student Association and the Office of Religious Life to continue Ramadan activities. Um, the MSA has sent uh, care packages to, to students. Uh, we're doing a, a, a socially distant compliance aid celebration where you know there's going to be a virtual uh, Zoom room for people to come in and pass on aid greetings, but also, you know, we've gotten permission to chalk some areas of campus so that those who are particularly on campus, because those are the, the most vulnerable at this point, can sort of get out and sort of do some kind of like a scavenger hunt and, and um, a, a photo booth. And so students are trying to make the best of a, of a bad situation. Um, and much, much of that is, uh, much of the programming that would have been, been happening in person is still ongoing, just in a different format. Um, and then the last day on in, in opportunities is that suddenly there's this focus on mental health, which you know I think is is sort of a developing field in the Muslim community uh, in, in general. But now that you know the the pandemic has triggered these increased anxiety, increased stress, increased depression, um, we are getting um, feedback not just from the students and or the families, but also from the institutions to sort of address particular needs of the community. So that's, that's been an, op that's, a, that's definitely a, a growing field, uh, but it's definitely been a, an opportunity for us to re-examine how we view and um, address Muslim mental health. Uh, that's pretty much the, a, a brief overview of, of where things are for the students. I'll conclude with, um, with 
the reiteration that we need more data. They're linked to the survey and I'll post that in the chat once, once I'm done presenting. Uh, we are also conducting a storytelling project and documenting some of these things so that um, all of this is obviously, you know, hopefully once a once in a lifetime event for, for all of us. Um, and so that uh, we can sort of have a sense of how things went down uh, when, uh, you know, 20, 10, 20 years from now, people are looking at, at how um, uh, Muslims dealt with this situation. And um, uh, the survey and the, the, uh, as well, and my experience as well, recommends uh, more institutional support for Muslim students, not just institutional in terms of like institutions of higher education or academic institutions, but also Islamic institutions. So mosques or wellness centers um, to particularly target this, uh, this population and, and address some of their the needs that are specific to them. I know some of our other speakers are going to be addressing some of the, some of the mosque issues and so um, I'll let them address that but uh, essentially that's pretty much uh, what what I have to say. So I'll stop here and I'll be happy to continue engaging with you and in, in your questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm virtually clapping. <laughs> For, for on behalf of everybody. Um, all right, great. And we're now going to move on to uh, Marguerite Hill, if I can get some call on her to switch. There we go. Marguerite Hill is the co-founder and executive director of the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, um, Muslim ARC, a human rights education organization. And she is also co-founding, co-director of the Black Muslim COVID Coalition. She is a freelance writer, community organizer, and educator with wide-ranging research that includes transformations in Islamic education, colonial surveillance in northern Nigeria, anti-colonial resistance among uh, West Africans in Sudan during the early 20th century, inter-ethnic relations in Muslim communities, and the criminalization of Black Muslims. And she's also, like our previous speaker, a Stanford graduate. So we are delighted to welcome you back virtually um, and hope to again in person. Welcome. Thank you. So much of my work um, does inform what I do doing anti-racism work in the United States. And I bring that kind of the historical training and even some of the work that we did in oral history as an Africanist also inform our methodology. So it's definitely a pleasure to be here, obviously, there's like, you know, given the unfortunate circumstances and what we're trying to address, but it's also, you know, with every crisis, there's an opportunity for us to come, come together. Um, and so um, I named this talk, um, and at first I was like, well, what's, what's really, what's going to anchor what I'm talking about? Um, and, you know, in my Ramadan last 10 days fog, it I, it dawned on me, it's like, well, I'm actually giving a bunch of, like I'm giving a talk later today at Sapelo Square on Malcolm X. And today is Malcolm X's birthday. And so the message to the grassroots um, organizing in black Muslim communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm gonna talk about that and I'll try to provide some also framework for understanding of why in specific, why was important specifically to organize within Black Muslim communities, and also, you know, what are solidarity practices um, and opportunities that, that we have in this moment to do this intersectional work. Okay. So I guess in my overview, so the educator in me, which I love all, like I had a sneak peek of all the PowerPoints, but what I, like, I love to do objectives and I was like, am I gonna do objectives? It's like, you know, or just like the summary. So if I'm successful in, in my eight minutes and I'll put my timer on now, um, I'll cover black Muslims in the COVID-19 pandemic response, provide an overview of our theory of change and highlight some of our initiatives. Um, and they are related and we, and we really invite partnerships within the academy with what we're doing. We're already forming partnerships and given the scale and scope of what we're dealing with, we, we definitely need um, to have a partnership between the academy and grassroots org organizations. 
And so in light, like given that it is Malcolm X's birthday, um, usually when I do a Malcolm X talk, I really highlight the women in his life because that also becomes erased. Um, and, and to understand his legacy, we also have to understand the role of the women in his life in maintaining his legacy and supporting that. Um, and so that includes his sister's role, Betty Shabazz's role in, main, like, in getting that narrative out and his daughter's role, Ilyasa Shabazz. And so as I was looking for that, I was like, I found this quote that tended to be like very self-serving for the work that we're doing right now. I mean, she is definitely a hero of mine and she's giving talks at the Shabazz Center today. So for those who, if you can't make it, like watch the recording later, like his work is definitely still relevant and it informs like, his thought informs the coalition work that we're doing now at Muslim Art. And so um, just like what you said is like, I, I do work um, within, in, within the field of organizing, but Muslim Art has a unique position in that we're a capacity building organization. We are a human rights education organization focused on racial justice. We provide a lens at Muslim Art um, to talk about um, anti-black racism, all race, all forms of racism, Islamophobia and xenophobia from a racial justice lens. We work within Muslim communities specifically. That's like where, where our root and our heart is at of building capacity within Muslim communities for racial justice. But we also work with allied communities on training allied communities about the different ways that diverse Muslim communities are racialized. And what does that mean in solidarity practices um, our three-pronged approach is really lifting up the narratives and the work of those who are most marginalized in Muslim communities. That includes African-American, Black Muslims in general, um, and that includes like immigrant, Afro-Caribbean, those from the Afri uh, African continent, um, you know, many countries from because like, we have South African Muslims, uh, Black Muslims, we have East, West African, there's like very diverse um, experiences within the Black Muslim, the African Muslim diaspora. We also work with Latino Muslims and Native and Indigenous Muslims. And so that with our work in Standing Rock was lifting them up too. Um, so the grassroots, like Ilyasa Shabazz has this quote, grassroots work is not flashy and is rarely, rarely celebrated on the national level, but that is where change begins. And so that's been our approach is like that the solutions ultimately come from those who are most impacted. And when it comes to black Muslims, they're impacted by multiple forms of oppression. So you have anti-black racism, all the systemic issues and inequities, and we're seeing those now. Um, and we're getting those stories, even if we lack a lot of the data, the, the quantitative data. Um, but we're also impacted by the criminal justice system, um, and that actually leads to even more vulnerabilities for Black Muslims and the immigration system where Black Muslim immigrants are much more likely to get entrapped in the, in this, in the system and, and become deported. And so, so those are all like very tangible ways that um, those intersecting impressions can really impact Black Muslims. So um, this recent from like this recent research on on the studies shows that overall that the black the mortality rate for black americans is is two times higher than all groups and while you know covid is you know has impact on people of color we have to note there's like a sp specific way like this number is is very alarming and um when we first formed um, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition, we didn't have those numbers, but we knew that with all of the stressors from the pre-existing conditions to the ways in which um, racism leads to um, additional stresses, right, that, that can exacerbate pre-existing conditions. So there's the racial battle fatigue, like um, psychologists have talked about just the, the um, emotional, physical impact of racism. So, um, you know, around to, uh, March 19th, the National Muslim COVID Task Force formed, and both Muslim Wellness Foundation and Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, we, um, we were on that task force, and we worked to help draft the initial statement, 
which was meant to, you know, encourage Muslims within Muslim communities to, um, to close down communal prayers, to stop during Juma, to like make this plan to like follow CDC recommendations. At the time, like the week before we formed, there were still a lot of questions and misinformation. Um, and so what we found was that within the national spaces, like there are organizing fields and networks, both formal and informal that are convened by funders, that are convened by networks, some of them coming out of the post 9-11 work. And a lot of that post 9-11 work we found that there was an exclusion of Black-led organizations and the underrepresentation of Black Muslims within kind of both rapid response networks, within um, organizing fields, within national Muslim organizations, a complete, like, and given that Black Muslims make 20%, um, 20, 25%, um, that underrepresentation is deeply felt. And so what we found was like, um, both Camilla Mutman, Rashad, and I, we were the only Black Muslims that were in that meeting. And, in, you know, after that, we had a discussion, um, and there were discussions she was having, and when she called me and asked me what did I think that needed to happen, and she shared what um, she thought needed to happen, um, you know, and, and she was coming in from the perspective as a psychologist um, who focuses on racial healing, and my work, which is right, like within the kind of organizing field of building capacity for racial justice by providing popular education um, and also training nonprofit leaders to um, for better solidarity practices. So we we launched after a few days of discussion and surveying the, the field in March 23rd, 2020 to address so this year to address the need to effective planning, preparedness and organizing in black Muslim communities during this global pandemic. So we did a lot of like kind of that weekend, a flurry of both research and, and, and she had the framework of the psychology of pandemics. And what we saw that there was a need of um, preparing to mitigate the risk factors, develop resilience and strengthen leadership. Um, so we were already in that early phase. And so we knew we had to disseminate accurate health information and precautions, dispel myths, um, meet basic needs. And so we started doing needs assessments. And, um, oh, that's my timer saying I'm over eight minutes, but I'll try to be like really quick. So this, you know, so our, our approach was for this long term work. Um, so our vision was really to, um, was established on the belief that liberation, healing justice and self determination are inextric inextricably linked. So we drew on the legacy of our ancestors, which includes Malcolm X and, and those who were part of um, the Black radical tradition in a bold initiative to strengthen leadership, support wellness, and provide political and economic education for personal and social transformation. So we gathered about 40 um, volunteers initially, and these were all like leading, whether they were student leaders, um, psychologists, Black Muslims who are leaders in their fields, doctors, psychologists, organizers, and we all came together to, to really push out a lot of programming. Um, so this, you know, Black Muslims are very diverse, even sectarian-wise, different approaches, but we drew on this, you know, on Ahaj Malik Shabazz's thoughts of um, that we had to unite our efforts. And so from there, we have like a digital, like an organizing strategy of network leadership, of um, building out that like through a community organizing model. And given that black Muslims in general have been left out, like black people, there is a digital divide with black people. And that also includes black Muslims who are not part of the kind of digital organizing field. So our specific intervention is really providing those tools, digital organizing tools to connect a network by building a database, by building through Zoom calls, meetings, using everything that we can through one-to-ones to build out and strengthen our network. Um, you know, so we're still working on like what, what we, disseminating accurate information, um, supporting optimal health and wellness and supporting leaders. So our job right now is to build out and promote Black Muslim leadership so that because they are serving really underserved communities that are, are that are at risk. And so our goal is to make sure that they can get the resources and support so they can continue to be resilient. 
in our major areas of focus, and we have leaders within each of these fields in advocacy and organizing, arts and culture, economic development, educate, education leaders, health and wellness, and spiritual well-being. So we have chaplains, imams. Um, it's been really um, fantastic to see those who've stepped up and, and we're connecting across the country and even have um, Canadian um, participation in our programming. So since we've started in, in um, since March 23rd, we've had eight webinars, several radio shows. We meet weekly on our committee. So here are some of the ones where we've provided frameworks, um, including our own theory of change, um, bringing in doctors, uh, black Muslim doctors to talk about medical apartheid, um, doing the importance of oral histories through um, wisdom of the elders, um, and also providing wellness programs. And given that even during this time, we were all like, I don't, you know, everyone was really, really in, like affected by the murder of Ahmad Arbery. So we, we did have a town hall um, to for healing and a collective call for action. So those have been like some of our webinars. We also have like a research, um, you know, and these are um, either like, so the black community survey, which is aimed and I, at the bottom, but like that one, we have like RIB, I, IRB approval, for the wisdom of the elders. We are in process of that, of collecting oral histories of black elders. Um, during this crisis. Um, and then we also have directed for the Muslim community, the COVID loss survey that we're disseminating because we don't know the numbers of Muslims who have been lost. And for the black community survey, um, and this is led by um, Dr. Uh, Camila Motman Rashad and Dr. Sean Bediaco. Um, and um, this is actually one of the first studies we've heard of that's trying to collect, like incorporate faith um, across the African diaspora. So the impact of COVID on black communities in general. So there's some that's focused on Muslim communities of all kinds and some on black communities of all kind. And the wisdom of the elders is specific research on black Muslim elders. So we've had a lot of press coverage, like a lot of um, coverage of, of our efforts and the impact that we're doing to serve communities. Um, you know, and, and on our website, Black Muslim COVID Coalition, you could find those resources. Um, and so, you know, here's like the ways that for those who'd like to follow us, um, you can follow us at BM Coalition at Twitter, Facebook, Black Muslim Coalition, because our goal is to continue, like once we build out this infrastructure for organizing, that this would continue beyond the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marguerite. Uh, it's all inspiring to see how much work that you have all been doing and such necessary work in this really challenging time. Um, and I'll be interested to hear, I think a theme that came up also with the BIA's talk is some of the opportunities that the lockdown has presented for new kinds of networks to emerge. And I'll be interested to see how that um, plays out in, um, for, for both of you or for all of us in this uh, conversation. So thank you. So our third speaker, uh, Shabana Mir, is Associate Professor of Anthropology and the Director of Undergraduate Studies at American Islamic College in Chicago, where she also teaches Islamic studies, gender studies, and research methods. She's the author of an award-winning book, Muslim American Women on Campus, Undergraduate Social Life and Identity, which received an outstanding book award from the National Association for Ethnic Studies. She is also an international public speaker on gender, religion, education, and politics. And we are so pleased to have you also join us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm so pleased to be here. Um, such wonderful speakers. And I've learned so much uh, just today. So thank you. It's hard to follow uh, Marguerite and uh, Abia, but I will try. Um, uh, so Bismillah rahman rahim thank you for having me uh, on this panel. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to address a uh, primarily congregational prayer in Muslim American communities and how that um, uh, certain statements and certain responses from the community um, shed light on ruptures uh, and on erasures. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, has further highlighted certain ruptures and erasures, and that's what I'm going to shed light on. 
So um, uh, obviously we know uh, we're here in the United States. Our response uh, on a governmental level has not been great. It's been staggered. It's been slow. And what I find uh, is that the uh, community uh, and mosque uh, responses have also reflected the government responses, as in they're not perfect. And so we could have done a lot better and we could have saved uh, more lives had we responded in a timely fashion. So the religious communities, for the most part, have reflected the slow responses of governments. But in religious communities, leadership, we in Muslim communities tend to have uh, relatively top-down uh, forms of leadership in many organizations, not all. Uh, and this is tied, of course, to the views of donors, um, the loudest critics, and then of rank and file members. So there is some resistance to change among many of um, these responses. And what do you, we have often seen prior to COVID is that uh, religious leaders and communities and organizations, if they respond um, uh, too hastily <laughs> to circumstances, uh, that they can, uh, ex and, and they express views that are too in line with contemporary circumstances that they can uh, experience sort of a risk to their legitimacy as religious authorities at times. So in late February, uh, March or so, Muslim Americans start to wake up to the reality of the coronavirus uh, pandemic being here rather than over there. Uh, so the alarm is raised a little bit late and there is a little bit of reluctance to take serious action. So in late March, we have some statements from uh, Muslim organizations. And one example, I'm going to share my screen here to show my not as fancy PowerPoint, but it's there. Uh, so, um, okay, so we have uh, a joint statement from the National Muslim Task Force on COVID-19. Uh, this was around March 18th. Uh, and the um, statement basically says, listen, take this seriously. We wish you would suspend congregational prayers entirely, but we know there's a ikhtilaf on this issue, so talk to your people, fine. But we really recommend that you suspend congregational prayers uh, and Juma prayers. And a collection of organizations do um, sign up to um, this uh, statement. And this does include, uh, up here, the Fiqh Council of North America. But then the Fiqh Council of North America issues another statement uh, from the executive director, exhorting the Muslim American communities to, yes, take uh, pandemic precautions uh, and to modify practices as kind of a moral duty. Uh, and so what it says is that um, um, the one's personal desire to do obligatory prayers at the masjid or fulfill religious duties comes second to ensuring the common health of the larger community. So uh, basically what you see is that praying at the masjid in the middle of a pandemic becomes almost a personal, almost a selfish desire. So, but this is not enough. So we need kind of textual evidence. So the statement goes on to say, uh, well, look at the example of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, who says um, uh, um, he refuses to enter Syria when it was afflicted by an epidemic. And when there's a response to that, he says, well, we escaped from the command of Allah to the command of Allah. Uh, so, um, Pandemic precautions basically is not an irreligious response. It is a religious and a moral response. And then the uh, Fifth Council response goes uh, on, the statement goes on to the prophetic hadith that urged Muslims to take pandemic precautions. So uh, flee leprosy as if you flee a lion. Now, when you do flee a predator, a carnivorous predator, you don't flee it, you know, you don't tiptoe away, you uh, tiptoe it away from it slightly. You kind of make haste, right? All haste. And so if you, you know, know anything about virus transmission, you take the logical step, which is basically to shut down the congregational prayer. But the uh, statement does not, uh, it takes a step back after saying that. And it says that, uh, okay, if you're sick or you're fearful of being sick, that's a shari excuse to avoid congregational prayer. That's kind of a focus on individual order, basically, right? Uh, the object is protecting yourself. But that doesn't obviously recognize how viral transmission works. It's societal spread. Uh, so um, the statement says that healthy Muslims can hear. It says healthy Muslims can populate the masjid and reduce numbers and for limited uh, periods of trying. So like, how are those reduced numbers going to be achieved? All right, who goes first? Elderly adults, women, 
and children and individuals with, I mean, it's like a strange motley assortment of demographics, right? Okay, elderly adults, we get that. Children, we get that. People with symptoms of disease, like women, like where, how? <laughs> Are women sick inherently? Are women inherently elderly? So it's a strange kind of uh, response where you kind of go from science to medieval in a sudden like warp, right? But this is not strange to many readers because uh, the capital T traditional approach to many mosque congregations is already male centric. We've all heard the, well, you should really stay at home, you should really pray in a private chamber and so on. I wanna uh, just very quickly uh, shout out to uh, Asma Said's very brief article, which you can look at. Sorry, my design ideas are open there. Um, so um, Asma Said's article talks about how uh, the ijma on women's prayer at home actually contradicts hadith uh, so that it favors a fitna-based emergency ruling. And an emergency ruling would basically last for centuries. Uh, so to return to um, the Fiqh Council statement, it offers various modifications. Um, and, and speaking of the women's uh, kind of role, we have a little example from Hind Maki's side entrance where you have like a women's corner. So the visibility issue is already there, right? In mosques. And you already have inferior spaces where you can't participate in the main space. Uh, and then you have the whole CCTV issue. So the, um, uh, the Fifth Council uh, response then goes on to say, okay, you know, let's have smaller crowds, shorter footballs, et cetera, but ultimately concludes this final uh, comment is mosques shall organize and allow Friday prayers for those who intend to perform the Friday obligation. So it takes that stand after saying all that stuff about how really we should save lives and so on. So it still goes on to say, well, we're going to do that. And this is interesting because, and just a very quick side note away from North America to Pakistan, which I follow uh, because I'm from there, um, we have um, uh, an energetic campaign uh, from uh, against social distancing insofar as it affects congregational prayer. So Mufti Taqi Usmani, for example, says there's no rationale for shutting down congregational prayer or Juma. Uh, so there's a st there's like a stand taken there. And ultimately what happens with all that, uh, with all the, um, you know, the furor is that the, uh, the Madaris and the Masajid uh, and the ulama come to a, an agreement with the government saying, okay, you will not shut down the mosque, you will not shut down the daily prayer, but we'll do stuff like shorter khutbahs and so on. Uh, so those are, but so, so there you have the mosques will remain open and daily prayers uh, will continue uh, with a few kind of caveats that I've kind of outlined there. Okay, so, uh, so there's kind of a global reflection process that's happening among various scholars and communities. So you see that reflected in uh, North America. Now, why is this happening, right? If the Hadith had said, you got to show up at the mosque, pray your congregational prayer, no matter what is happening out there, then we would have a textual problem, right? But we don't have the textual problem. So we are not there, in Umar's words, taking refuge from uh, Allah's command to Allah's command. We're staying in the command that we basically chose, right? Uh, now, for the most part, I've actually done a quick and dirty survey of uh, North American Muslim communities, and for the most part, many mosques have actually been closed, but not all. Uh, and as the government starts to open up, uh, the mosques are starting to push forward as well in that respect, and I'm, we're probably going to see some bad results um, about that as well. Uh, now, before, just before Ramadan, um, uh, now when, the, when these mosques open up, what we find is also that there is some restrictive, gender restrictive language uh, from certain mosques that are opening up. So again, the question of how are we going to kind of reduce numbers, uh, this is kind of the response. So from one mosque in uh, New Mexico, um, we have this response, okay, come to the mosque with wudu, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things. But what are we going to do to reduce the numbers? We can accommodate 20 men and five women, right? Uh, so again, you have this interesting calculation of men belong in the mosque and women, okay, we'll give you a little space. So you have, uh, women are basically like the minor's canary in the mosque, right? They disappear first. Just before Ramadan, we had uh, all over social media, this really emotional and poignant expression from a lot of Muslims of how we were going to miss being uh, at the mosque. And so a lot of people are talking about how they're going to feel bad. We're fasting at home. The kids are here. I can't really concentrate. And, you know, women are like, 
welcome to our lives, right? Um, so uh, the same uh, thing uh, is experienced in a lot of mosques before COVID-19, where you, for example, uh, have a very, very different experience. So COVID-19 has kind of brought out uh, that experience and allowed, you know, men to <laughs> have a little piece of that experience uh, with us as well. Right, now, uh, uh, one controversy before Ramadan related to congregational prayer was the, uh, the whole uh, storm in a teacup about virtual taraweeh, right? So people are trying to say, how can we get spiritual sustenance at a virtual taraweeh prayed, you know, via an imam on screen and so on. So, uh, but, but, uh, but imams, certain imams came out uh, against capital T traditional, uh, came out against that. One of them saying that it was basically like a slippery slope then if we make an exception for the pandemic, ooh, maybe we'll be stuck with that and our, you know, in-person massages will become irrelevant, you know, will we care about the imams and so on. So, um, so what we, the, you almost find this idea of we here now, right, should not be the creators of precedent. The precedent should be back then and that's where we should draw uh, our precedents located uh, in the past. But the, that body of scholarship, that is located in the past does not claim to be the last interpretive word on how to be Muslim, right? So we he see here again, the same sort of discussions on authority and legitimacy that arise during the pandemic uh, and challenge us to respond to circumstances. And you have the same kind of, uh, if we respond to circumstances, will we still be authentic? So authenticity, orthodoxy, legitimacy become uh, key concerns. One of the scholars whose the statements kind of was circulating quite a bit, Hatim al Hajj, said that the uh, household uh, imam rotation for prayer at home should include women and girls. Awesome. We already have hadith for that. But he also opposes virtual taraweeh because he says the essence of congregational prayers is to bring the Muslims together in the service of God, and these virtual congregations do not do that. So that's interesting, right? That the, that the congregation is basically a togetherness, right? So one might argue that in these times um, uh, that the uh, notion of togetherness, the experience of togetherness may have changed somewhat, right? In these globalized times and these technologically new uh, changes that we're experiencing, and also the question that must be asked is that notion, this notion of togetherness, to what degree does it exclude many, many, many demographics? So for example, uh, many Muslims who are disabled, who are unable to participate uh, in in-person um, congregations, uh, how do the, our mostly inaccessible mosques include them? And why should we not then therefore take a step uh, that would include them? Uh, so the pandemic, for the most part, does um, um, bring out new uh, sort of um, shifts in the community, uh, but it also highlights erasures. Uh, and what we find is that um, uh, this, uh, this whole idea of uh, praying uh, using the screen, right? We talked about the screen like a virtual taraweeh. And uh, when the imams came out, certain imams came out against it, then the response was, was, oh, okay, so you're against making salat through a screen, but that's what women are doing in many massages anyway, right? So you have the CCTV. Is that prayer valid for women or is women's prayer not really important? So, um, so we have kind of an interesting bubbling up of issues. It's not to say that there are not good things that are happening. Hind Maki has written an article on religious news uh, service about how um, women are actually having new opportunities to speak via virtual spaces. But uh, one might argue that those virtual spaces, the existence of women in those virtual spaces, are they perhaps highlighting the fact that women can't be in the other spaces, right? So, um, so those are the, so the question remains, you know, um, in a state of, um, you know, creating that rupture anyway. It doesn't resolve the question. So uh, that's my uh, spiel for the most part, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Shabana. That was Thank you. really terrific. And so helpful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also just like to remind everybody that if you have a question that you'd like to ask, um, following our last speaker who's coming up next, um, could you please uh, message me through the chat and I, we will deal with 
with the questions as they come in. Um, if you'd like me to ask your question, let me know. Or if you'd like to, to read it yourself, then we will unmute you. Okay, our last speaker, uh, but not least, of course, uh, is Mujahid Biliji. Um, he, he is Associate Professor of Sociology at John Jay College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Uh, so right there in the middle of the Corona's most impacted uh, part of the United States. So um, we send you all of our thoughts and, and prayers uh, for managing the situation in New York City. He's the author of Finding Mecca in America, How Islam is Becoming an American Religion. And his research besides this also includes Muslim diasporas, including Kurds in the US, Kurdish identity, and Turkish society. Bileche is a faculty fellow at the CUNY Dispute Resolution Center and a frequent commentator and speaker on Kurdish and Muslim issues in the contemporary Middle East and in the United States. So welcome and thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking Anna and Zach for organizing this panel and uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everybody. Uh, quarantine itself is a form of fasting, abstention, distance, avoidance. Remembering Mary Douglas, both religion and quarantine are about maintaining purity in the face of danger, be it the danger of pandemic or the danger of forgetfulness of God or falling away from the safety of the Ummah. In these days of worldwide social distancing, the phenomenon of religion becomes visible and is reenacted at a societal and even global scale. Today, I want to focus on three areas in my discussion of the pandemic's impact on American Muslims. These are the impact on rituals, the impact on clerical authority, and finally, the impact on the overall Muslim public sphere. Some of the issues were uh, already highlighted, highlighted by previous speakers, but I think they are relevant, so we'll uh, talk about them. So what are the uh, effects with respect to rituals? The pandemic has been disruptive to all religious communities in the US, including American Muslims. Believers find themselves forced to reevaluate the necessity and purpose of cherished Ramadan rituals when it is no longer possible to perform them in congregation. So what does that mean? First of all, there is interruption of repetition. Uh, rituals are all about repetition and interruption of the given character of rituals harms their spontaneity and saps their strength. So after this Ramadan, next Ramadan, how people are going to feel about uh, uh, Tarawih and other uh, rituals. For Sunnis, at least for men, the defining experience of Ramadan is attending Tarawih every night. For many, this is what gives the days and nights their uh, distinctive shape. So we, we can talk about the kind of interruption that is happening in the nature of rituals as uh, repeti repetitive acts. Uh, another effect is the socialization effect. What happens to the rituals of religion when the social is withdrawn from them? Uh, you know, Durkheim, sociologist Durkheim famously said, religion is eminently social phenomena, right? So if if those rituals are congregational and in the absence of congregation, what is left? Are they still uh, necessary? Are they still valid? Because the messages are closed, the main congregational prayer, Juma, cannot be performed. So we see a shift from public congregation to family congregation in the private sphere. One can speak of a home masjid parallel to the evangelical concept of the home church. Of course, it comes with the complications of uh, male authority figures telling people um, uh, or recommending uh, praying at home to women uh, in order to avoid, as a way of avoiding the issue of improving women's space uh, in the masjid, as, Shabai, as Shabaina mentioned already. So that's, uh, that's one of the uh, effects in terms of uh, uh, ritual. Then we can speak of a delocalization effect. Now that Muslims have the whole internet at their disposal, they can easily choose the best recitation, the best online lecture. So they are no longer captive to local talent. These things were of course available before, but always with opportunity cost. 
you want to participate locally to keep up with the doings of your own community or to maintain face there. But that leaves less time and less justification for relying on the wider resources on the web. So now we can speak of a kind of new situation in that respect. There is also uh, the unsettling of the meaning that is happening. Uh, pandemic, the pandemic either intensifies or weakens the meaning of particular rituals. Uh, I think uh, Abia uh, talked about uh, increased religious observance among the uh, students, and this is uh, related to that. Uh, so it intensifies the meaning of ritual because as people think more seriously about what they perform, they invest a new meaning in their actions and experience a more enhanced spirituality. Particularly for those whose Arabic is not strong, it may turn out that reading Quran for themselves in translation is a more meaningful experience. Also, dhikr is reconfigured when it is a private experience. Uh, dhikr in congregation is intensely interpersonal. Uh, the spiritual vibe is built by everyone doing the same thing at the same time. Individual dhikr is more inward and sensual. Or alternatively, they may end up questioning the necessity of Muslims or believers might end up questioning the necessity of some rituals, such as tarawih not being able to automatically continue to do it raises the question of the religious status of those rituals. Can you pray Juma at home? Uh, wouldn't that be a contradiction in terms? Uh, is Tarawih really a prophetic uh, uh, practice? How obligatory is it? Of course, for Shia Muslims, it is not and never uh, was. But these questions are triggered uh, by the lockdown and uh, they become uh, pathways to kind of critical thinking, uh, further reflection, and so on. So what are the impact on the clerical authority? In this climate of procedural uncertainty, the need to consult with religious authorities takes on unusual importance. The pandemic, however, is striking the American Muslim community at a particularly interesting moment, when religious clerical authorities increasingly contest it. Believers' bonds to and confidence in the authority of local imams has for, has for some time been eroding, challenged by distant, delocalized, national-level sources, level sources of religious guidance. That is, the online speakers and preachers. With the suspension of local physical religious experience outside of one's house, self-styled authority figures in the digital Muslim public sphere gain an unprecedented equivalence with local imams and community leaders. You can choose your khutbah now. It remains to be seen the extent to which local authority will lose its privileged position under shelter-in-place conditions. But there is no doubt that the elastic and elective nature of religious authority among American Muslims will become more entrenched and more visible through this crisis. Imams who now cannot lead the rituals lean into more customized lectures for different age groups. Whereas before, Imams' talks after Fajr or between Maghrib and Isha were aimed at the small audience of the truly hardcore mosque attendees. Now there is a sense that there is a captive audience to win, but it is a different audience. Talks can be more frequent, but, but they are brief and meant to appeal to a range of audiences. Reading Rumi's poetry at dawn, Sahaba stories for children, post Maghrib tafsir of the most familiar surahs are some of the examples. This might lead to a different kind of attachment between imams and congregations. If the person at the mimbar is a stern, authoritative figure, the friendly man who tells you stories at home is reliable and relatable in a different way. But for many Muslims, rather than intensifying their relationship with their local community, the pandemic is an opportunity to look elsewhere. And like all internet experiences, news, social contents, one's religious intake becomes a bubble. Suddenly it is at least potentially possible to leave behind all the irritants of your local congregation and find speakers who are entirely sympathetic, who cater to your particular tastes and prejudices. 
and we can call this one the Netflix effect. ISNA, ISNA is an example of a national organization that has capitalized on this shift in interest. They have been offering Friday reflections at 1 p.m., the taking, taking the place of a Juma khutbah during Ramadan, mostly with female speakers. For women who long for a female voice in congregational settings, even if they might see impediments to women-led prayer, this is a step towards increasing women's presence on the religious stage. So opportunities and persisting, persisting obstacles all uh, present themselves in a mixture of, uh, that fit, befits the crisis times. All right, so with respect to the overall Muslim public sphere, the pandemic is creating shifts of thinking and emphasis that may or may not survive beyond the present crisis. Uh, one of them is the vindication of certain Muslim ritual practices, such as wudu regular hand washing and so on, and niqab. Uh, in a recent uh, public uh, uh, speech, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad uh, remarks about European leaders being forced to wear niqab. So this kind of juxtaposing niqab and mask uh, is an interesting uh, <laughs> gesture and it allows Muslim to say, hey, we, you see, we were right, you know. Uh, and so niqab is kind of you know, naturalized, normalized. Uh, one of the newspaper headlines was that in France, burqa remains banned and mask, uh, masks are you know, required. All right. Uh, another uh, outcome is the salience of some virtues. Some virtues are becoming highlighted, like zakat, you know, giving patience, family, and so on. Uh, of course, donation-seeking charities are the winners of this time. So monetization of religious deeds, that has always happened, but now you know, there aren't that many outlets. We have that. There is a domestic turn in Ramadan charity. Uh, the Ramadan imperative to support the hungry has mostly been directed abroad. This year with the needs of, of non-Muslim neighbors, so starkly visible. Ramadan giving is both more domestically focused and more, one can say, personal practical assistance and charity to non-Muslims is a higher priority now. If all you can do for the Rohingya is send money, for your immediate neighbor, you can bring a meal, take food to a food pantry, make masks for health workers and so on. And finally, there is this model minority opportunity. Here in New York and New Jersey, there has been a lot of publicity about gatherings of Hasidic Jews for weddings, funerals and religious services that break the rules prohibiting large gatherings. In New York City, Mayor de Blasio has been feuding publicly with some important rabbis who insist that public health orders restricting gatherings are affronts to their religious liberty and even acts of covert anti-Semitism. Muslims, it seems, are taking the opportunity to present themselves as a model minority. Uh, at least in East Coast, if not the Midwest. So, uh, and making it clear to civic authorities that mosques are closed, Muslims are not congregating in other spaces and that for, far from endangering the public health, they are supporting food banks, encouraging health workers and generally acting as good, obedient citizens. So I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's interesting to see how many overlapping issues have come up in these all these different contexts, and I, I really appreciate everybody's um, uh, insights. There's questions around shifting authority and um, what changes that are occurring might be ongoing. What are temporal? Um, what are what are the questions that uh, are sticking in my head, and I have several of my own, but I think we'll start our first set of questions, if I can get um, Zach, if you could highlight um, uh, Casey Fong. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Ooh, yeah, hi. Um, I, it was, I don't know, I missed the first 10 minutes, I don't know if it was answered in the question, but um, in like in the like the first part of the talk, but um, I was just wondering like I'm not Muslim myself, but like a lot of my friends are, and like I'm in an area where it's like there's a lot of Muslim communities, and I was wondering maybe to all of 
like all of the panelists like what advice would you give um for me to be able to support my friends and the muslim community especially during this time it's a really kind and thoughtful question um i don't know uh, abia since you're working on campus here do you have you noticed uh, opportunities that non-muslim students have taken to support their muslim uh, colleagues yeah that's uh, th thank you for your question casey that's a, a really uh, thoughtful question um it's really difficult to answer that, however, because a lot of time the support that we look for has to do with meeting people or sort of congregating or some kind of social support, which is all of that is sort of um, um, not happening right now. Uh, what we have seen, however, from uh, people who are not Muslim uh, but are still wanting to be empathetic is sort of uh, replicate that digitally to some extent. So a lot of the submissions on our community creative archive, not all of them are necessarily Muslim by Muslim identifying uh, students, um, but they're still submitting uh, to to that group because they want um, they want their art and their poetry to be documented as part of this particular project. Um, we're also seeing that particularly in Ramadan, uh, there is support in the sense where you know, the, the students on campus are um, not being able to see community. Uh, a lot of the support that's coming in is coming in from either students or uh, officials who are not necessarily Muslim identifying, but sort of wanting to celebrate these occasions with them, whether it's helping with the chalking, for example, around campus, or um, um, it's sort of just checking in. And I think the checking in aspect is really, really key because the, 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 the most heightened feeling at this point is a feeling of isolation. And so I think even a phone call or a video call to pick up you know, and, and sort of call your friends and say how they're doing, that would mean a lot in a time like this for students who are really just feeling very, very lonely because they're not with their families and they're not with, with their, able to spend time with their friends either. And so I would recommend something along those lines and maybe some other speakers have other ideas as well. So would any of you like to chime in on that? Marguerite, Shabana, Shabana, sorry, um, Mujahid? Marguerite? Say like oh, affirming okay. the Muslimness, right? Like sometimes, you know, what for especially for Muslim minorities, we you know, there's a tendency to kind of downplay the Muslimness and then, you know, and then there's nothing. It's it's like, I mean, the scale of what what people have experienced even in the organizing spaces and, and the trauma of this is and I mean and especially like I mean there's no it was very rare to see like a visible display of of aid, you know, and given the anth like anti-Muslim sentiment, just having something, whether you send a card of saying Eid Mubarak, like happy holidays, like that rarely happens. Like, you know, I mean, but it, it has been affirming, you know, when someone says like, you know, they say like, oh yeah, my, my friend's Muslim and they're fasting. I hope you have a good fast, or, you know, like just some affirmation of the Muslim identity, um, of some visible support. I mean, even if it's something where neighbors can come and, and have their signs during Eid, like that would just be such an uplifting experience. Like, and I think even beyond the, you're welcome here Muslims, but just like Eid Mubarak to our Muslim family. And, you know, so that it's not just, um, I mean, I know like even given like with hate crimes in the nineties, like there was like in Montana, they were targeting the Jewish community. And so like everybody put little menorahs in their windows. So something like that, like at that scale, even if you didn't make it this Ramadan, cause we have Eid al-Adha. So like Hajj is canceled, Christmas is canceled, New Year's is canceled. East, it's like the whole equivalent of like a year's worth of holidays. Like that's all been canceled for us. So, you know, there's, even if we can't make it this, this Eid, the next one, you know, you kind of have to look it up. You have a three day window to do it and stuff for in two months from now. But some affirmation I think would be like that neighborly affirmation would be great. We'll, you know, we're all thinking about how we could be nicer to our neighbors. I got to buy my neighbors some gifts too. But I'm like, I don't think they'll want dates. They'll be like, what is this? You know, but like something that may be useful. But um, I think, you know, a small token visually would be would be really awesome. Just in support of Margaret's uh, 
uh, remarks. I think it, it's important to have affirmation. This is from New York Times, a uh, full page, actually three pages devoted to Ramadan, you know, under uh, pandemic conditions. And it's, it's a great thing, uh, you know, experience to see Muslim life not being in international news, not even domestic, you know, politics. You know, I have been tracing its gradual migration from foreign affairs then to the domestic politics, terrorism, security, then to culture and now food. If, you know, once you reach the kitchen, you are at home, I can tell you that. So it, <laughs> it's very important that identity is uh, affirmed and you're recognized, your existence is acknowledged. Uh, Muslims need it and everybody need it. So Muslims also are under the obligation of acknowledging other identities. Yeah. yeah. And I, yeah, I'd also just uh, highlight that for Casey and anybody else that um, Eid is coming up likely on Sunday here in the US and that will be an opportunity to uh, reach out to, to those in your community um, and be particularly aware of, their, of the importance of Eid greetings at that time. So um, other ways to support, of course, are to support some of the many charities and other good causes that Muslim networks in America or um, worldwide are involved in. And if that's something that you can do with time, um, with social media energy, or with, um, with other resources, then that's, of course, also maybe a way that you can participate if that's uh, valuable to you uh, or to anybody. So we have another question um, from Nicole uh, Carreri. If we can unmute her. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. And I just want to thank you for organizing a very diverse panel with really useful um, information. I'm a third year student now. I've just finished my last uh, coursework seminar of my life. Um, I'm going into my third year PhD um, in Islamic studies in the religion department at BU. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, Professor Shaban Amir's discussion of women and their access to the mosques, and I've been following her tweets, and we worked on it in Professor uh, Keisha Adi's uh, Sharia class. So the Muslim leadership that you've discussed and the response from the women seem to be happening on two different channels. One, the response is coming through Twitter or online articles and so forth. What have you seen or have you seen the um, bridging of those two bodies, if you will, Muslim uh, mosque leaderships or the various fiqh councils um, responses, and are they beginning to have more dialogue rather than uh, operating in two different spheres? Um, the other question I had was um, thinking again also about Shia Muslims being brought into this dialogue. That's my um, particular study area and interest. Um, and so those are my questions. And just as a note, I wanted to comment on this uh, Abdul Hakim Murad making a parallel of niqab and um, you know world leaders wearing a face mask. These are very um, different things, especially if you study gender. Obviously, niqab is about not being sexually enticing women in public spaces, a whole different discussion. So um, I thought that parallel was a little problematic, wanted to mention that. I will wait for your responses and thank you again to the really great work that all of you are doing and sharing with us. Shabana. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. That's a really good question. I don't want to make it seem that all of these um, uh, primarily male uh, organization leaders or community leaders or religious leaders uh, are coming at it from the same perspective. Um, but you do find, like, like I said, there is uh, pressure uh, from, um, well, uh, the loudest critics, for example, to remain legitimate. Uh, and so there is that uh, kind of a, um, a tendency to stay with the most conservative common denominator, if you want to call it that, right? So there is a tendency to remain there. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, uh, due to, I don't know, the, what do you call it, the religious community industry that relies so much on donations, right? You really can't remain completely insulated as an organization or as a religious leader. And so there is um, uh, sort of a, some responsiveness more than there was in the past. I would say, uh, to uh, bridging these different uh, perspectives, if you have it, um, uh, than there was in the past. Uh, so there is more of an openness to even engage with different perspectives than there was before. Uh, so I will, I, will, I will give it that. 
Um, and I will also um, uh, uh, allow that there are some organizations that have made movements towards make, you know, uh, made the right noises in particular directions. I've heard of ISNA moving in certain directions to make sort of an inclusive mosque. Uh, but from what I'm seeing, for the most part, most of these organizations are not doing enough. And I'll, I'll, you know, say that <laughs> very clearly uh, that they are not doing enough to make uh, inclusive uh, religious spaces, uh, which is why there is kind of a almost a celebration of well now we're in a virtual space which kind of levels the playing field somewhat, uh, but that's not good enough. Right to um, to say that there was even a response from some um, capital T traditional uh, women to say, well, let's not uh, jump into kind of uh, religious modifications such as virtual tarawehs and so on, because then we'll abandon the religious spaces to essentially um, in the same um, sexist arrangements that they have. And I, I just, I don't agree with that at all. Um, so, cause, cause they're already there and they've had plenty of time to adjust. So, uh, so, but there is an issue of architecture where the virtual space does not have the architecture or the, the physical barriers that exist in the mosque space. Uh, so, so there is conversation. There are um, relative, um, there is some degree of responsiveness, but it is not enough. Yeah, Was so, there another question? So I would, I would add like, because, you know, like, you know, like I've been involved in the National Muslim Task Force, like, you know, like in, and to see how, I mean, the National Muslim Task Force, like the anchor organizations are Muslim health professionals. So it's like, you know, American Muslim health professionals in Imana, which is also like a group of doctors who have like, are the anchor organizations who are thinking about public health. And it's divided on committee levels, right? For like, you know, bringing together like imams and, you know, like for, for their own outreach. And they're, and they're fairly kind of, you know, and many of that, like the, within the, American Muslim health professionals and and even like with some of the more traditional like ISNA like there they haven't been as like there there has existed a pre-existing like network for rapid response ever since the R3 winners campaign which was like the murder of like three Muslims and you know and then some of these groups had worked in a loose network um, and so social media, which it provides a platform, whether, you know, even starting out with blogging and, and then social media posts where people speak back. So like now the critics can be much, you know, louder, right? And then sometimes like that's also dismissed. But I would also just kind of highlight that, I mean, even if we're talking about the top down, you know, institutions, many of these institutions have women deeply involved in them. It doesn't mean that they won't replicate, you know, like, gendered based norms they won't replicate sexism but it's like but you have like women that are active participants in in these organizations in you know supporting writing up statements and um you know and that there there's a lot of it's very discursive you know and like a lot of um you know like as far as like that people like how they're navigating um even across difference of you know like like I know like from from my part when when we first they start first started the outreach I would you know I started looking for the Shia and like connecting outside of that and you know and then in response to also just recognizing the absences in the network the need to like incorporate since these were national like that was like national groups but what happens locally on Shoda councils and those are like sort of so there's like some of those silos but it's also like people are responding to conversations and meetings so like I, I it's definitely like a complex kind of you know like i said it's like very discursive lots of debates on authority lots of debates on like fiqh like just like just all these things that are happening that are um that are very you know that are very important discussions and but what I do sometimes see is like there is, you know, like being in those spaces, like there is a kind of gap between um, what's happening out there in the public and then like what are the stressors and the decision making that's happening on a local level. Like obviously like there's people serving their constituents, it's like mainly like donors and the, and the lay people who attend. And so like, and then it's like, they also have to deal with any of the PR crises. And so you'll have like silences that exist because 
you know, a, a leader is only a leader because they have followers. So it's like, if they lose their legitimacy, like that's it, you know? And so, and then also like you, you're having now people unemployed, like they're just like, they don't have work. So definitely very, very complicated. Um, I definitely agree. Like the, the, the co comparing the niqab to the, I mean, it's like people are saying they're kind of jokes looking for ways to, to enter in discussions, you know, around religion and, and, and what does it mean to be stigmatized, right, for, for people that do wear niqab? And then now, like, we're all, like, it's, you have to go, like, in Los Angeles, you have to wear a face mask to go outside, um, which for Black people, that leads to other dangers, right, for us. Like, it's just, like, wearing, a, wearing all that, like, it just can lead to, like, more policing and, and can lead to, you know, death, you know? So, um yeah, like, I mean, I think all of those, but I, what, what I am very much interested in is, is like, how do we have those kind of partnerships, especially through, you know, through from the academy, like where you have scholars that are doing this kind of deep work and then, you know, and then that there's these school networks that exist and resources that exist within the academy and like, that's not being connected to the grassroots work of like, how, because like a lot of mosques, like, they're feeding people like that was like one of the major concerns is like how do we take care of indigent people like how do we like we're feeding hungry people this is ramadan is where people get fed like there's so many constituents like we've had people that were like when they you know connecting the city council to feeding elders and then finding that many like you know in one black community in los angeles many of them were unhoused and how do we house people and there's tremendous stressors. And I think like for the most, like the, the prayers have been a big thing, but the actual philanthropy, you know, and then the de decrease of wealth, like where people had jobs, now all of a sudden they don't have jobs. And then how do they access halal food? How do they even access food that's nutritional, so nutritious? So it's a lot of like, what I'm seeing is like a lot of discussions happening within those kind of task force and, 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 you know, and then there's obviously like, you know, critiques within, you know, and debates that, that are driving for more equity and inclusion that are internally driven, right? And then there's the external pressures to make that happen. Um, thank you. That's a really a very complex and excellent question, Nicole, that set off a fantastic discussion. And what you were just saying, Marguerite, um, made me think of a concern that I've had that I'm not as aware of the United States context as I would like to be. Um, but in South Asia, and particularly in India, um, the crisis has made Muslim communities far more vulnerable, as they've often been accused of being super spreaders or being the source of the virus. It's often called the Muslim virus um, in some parts of the world. And I don't know the extent to which such um, kinds of vulnerabilities are being replicated in the US. I don't know if any of you are aware of ways in which we should be more conscious of the specifically um, dangerous uh, effects of that sort of accusation in, with American Muslim communities. Well, the contact tracing, like, so there's things like where now, like, people aren't as aware of, like, you know, like, even some of the measures to, like, trace people, which leads to surveillance. There's a lot of fears, especially within um, immigrant Black Muslim communities around, like, you know, like, there's a lot of, like, dis misinformation around if you get it, because there's a lot of people within the Somali community that have contracted it, and, like, so they're afraid that their children will be taken away, you know, like, so what's, what's going to happen? And so, um, both that and then you know i mean there was a, there was a statement by like trump made a statement about there's disparities like mosques are still open but churches were forced to close and so there was paranoia about like oh we have to issue a statement we you know like so there was like condemnations but you know like some people wanted to do a campaign to address address that but um you know as far as like you know the most you know the Muslim ban because we have an immigration ban so that's now still allowed it's like it's harder to organize so the org within the organizing justice world um it's still very difficult you know you have still ice harassing people so within the kind of justice issues and kind of discourses around that you know obviously like with COVID there's like anti-semitism blaming immigrants like all of that stuff and Muslims would just be 
you know, put right in there. Um, yeah. And it's harder to trace and to know because we're stuck kind of like in silos and we're not seeing things. And so, you know, for us to like look at the, the, um, the continual incursions on like human right, like on civil liberties. Um, we, you know, it also just, it just passed where, you know, once again, like they can, they can monitor, look at our browser thing without a, without a warrant, you know? So it's just like, so while it may not be the same as like, what's like the extent in India, and then we're also hampered in our activism, right? Like to d address India, to address Kashmir, address, the Uyghurs address Rohingya so it's like our activism like that international work has been shut down but like now you have this overarching like state of like you know and it's um we we're not as vigilant right now and I think we have to really take our time to like really look at what's happening on you know what's being passed what things of like how this tracing and you know like and and for many within the within the justice world, this is a really frightening time. I really appreciate that, um, and I wish we had more time <laughs> for a ongoing conversation with everybody. I know we said we'd go to one thirty, and we're we are at that time now. So I um, want to be mindful of your time and the fact that some of you have other events you have to continue on to today. And I really appreciate all of your your time. Um, your thoughtful comments and the audience for, for participating and for coming to, to hear this. And we hope to continue to have conversations like this. Um, one of the few positive sides is getting to, to have these other kinds of gatherings and congregations. And so um, I wish you all an early Eid Mubarak and I hope um, that the rest of your fast is easy and um, that all things will improve in time. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. I know. And goodbye, bye bye. Thank you all Thank you. so much. Thank you. It was such a pleasure to see your faces. Thank you for having us.